My name is Mei Chen. Um, my team owns the uh, .NET language and runtime, so including C Sharp, VB, language and compiler, and also runtime team. Yes, all the runtime services that Miguel just mentioned is underneath my team. Hi, I'm Sergei. Uh, I, my team is on Mei Chen's team, and uh, I lead, and uh, my team owns various low-level parts of .NET runtime, and uh, various uh, ahead of time compilation technologies. Sergey is my performance architect. Okay, then let's start. Do you mind to go to the next slide? So, what is the runtime? Um, I think it's probably quite obvious to you guys. <laughs> I prepared this slide for some, uh, like, a, not sure about the audience. Uh, this talk has been done once already. I think about runtime being a translator. If you think about it, you write your c -sharp code once, you compile it once, and it actually runs in all the different devices and different platforms. That is because the runtime is doing the translation for you. We have two well-known platform and really popular, Windows, Linux, four different architectures, x86, x64, ARM64. Um, and if you look at the matrix, it's at least eight different languages that runtime speak. And the Linux distro depends on the different distro, different flavor. There's actually a perform dependency work that runtime has to do as well. So this talk is going to be three parts. First part, we want to talk about how we tune the runtime for startup and throughput so that out the box installation that you have on the .NET Core or desktop is actually performing. The second part, Sergey will walk us through a startup time case study. And the third part, we will do some sort of takeaway. So before I jump in into the journey, I kind of want to break down, uh, call out three different services in runtime that actually uh, related to today's talk. They are more than these three services in the runtime, but these three actually kind of relevant to, to today's talk. I think JIT and GC are probably the most well-known components that you are familiar with because these are the two parts mostly uh, contribute to the non-determinism and latency and kind of manifest itself more in the performance on people's face. The first one is your type system. We don't talk about it a lot, but actually type system is the central of the universe. I would like to believe so because my first lead job was type system. It was actually the one that holds the universe together. Type system is the one that if you look at this kind of uh, skeleton code, type system is the one that decides that when you allocate my base or my class, how big that object instance should be. And when you have vtables, what does the layout look like? And when you do castings, are you doing the right thing or not? So JIT actually consult type system in order to generate code. And GC actually consult type system as well when you're trying to walk the graph. Next slide, please. So here comes to my first question. Uh, many of you are probably very familiar with this Hello World Web API question. Uh, this application is actually quite simple, just a few lines. Pretty much on a web page, pop a Hello World, and waiting for you to type a string in and display on that page. Do you guys want to guess how many methods need to be jitted in order to run this code? Miguel, since nobody volunteered. Uh, it's an MVC app? Uh, it's a, yep. Yeah, so a general MVC app about uh, 10,000. Okay, Miguel is very pessimistic. And I must clarify this on .NET Core because the desktop and .NET Core is different. Next slide, please. Uh, it's only 4,000, not too many, <laughs> but, but certainly it's greater than what you have expected. <laughs> Miguel is pessimistic. But if you look at the time, the startup is actually hot startup, is your 1.38 seconds. And this is actually measured on the machine that is actually uh, i7, um, Intel i7, um, 3.4 gigahertz. It's actually quite a beefy machine. So think about that if you go into a low end devices or, you know, the last capable machines, how long it will take. And we actually spent 1.49 seconds in JIT, which kind of surprises you because how can JIT time greater than the startup time? Because of multi-core. And that was actually summed up together. So we have a problem here. Um, Hello world take 1.38 seconds to start up. 
this is not okay because real world, real world application is going to use a lot more function than what, what than what you just see, right? So who is liable for this? It's actually in between JIT and type system. Um, we believe that these are the one that take about. 60% of the time in the startup, doing all the work, trying to prepare all those 4,000 methods to be jitted, and some may be wrong, and some may not be wrong. And interesting enough, this is my first job, being a type system lead. I went to type system guy. Actually, no, my first job was JIT. I had three dev. I went to the JIT and said, JIT, we are slow, and we are the reason why the code doesn't run fast. JIT said, nah, it's not our fault. It's type system. My second job, I was type system lead. I went to a type system team and said, hey, 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 David, we are slow. What should we do here? And David told me, nah, it was JIT. That doesn't make sense, right? Somebody must be at fault. It turned out to be type system only has 30%, 33%, one third of it. JIT has one third of it. None of them believe that they are the majority of the fault. And the other one third lend in that JIT E interface. Because remember early on that we talked about when JIT generate codes, it comes out type system. It asks many, many questions to the type system. And then so, so type system told JIT team, say, if you ask the last question, we will not be so slow. And then JIT, as you come back to type system and say, if you answer your question faster, we wouldn't be that slow. Regardless, somebody has to solve the problem, right? So I'm going to ask Sergey to solve this problem to me. Otherwise, we cannot ship. All right. Thank you. I'll try. Okay, as the Chin noted, the main problem here that I need to solve is the time we spend during the code during application startup. Uh, if we kind of step back, we think about, if I think about it, uh, what we do actually, we jit the same code every single time we run the app. We load the same libraries, we compare parse some, same config files and jit it. And end result, the code, the bit code actually that JIT produces is uh, exactly the same on every single invocation. Seems like wasteful. So how about we just cache it and reuse it later? So Engine is a tool that we built for the .NET framework to solve this problem. What it does is pretty much just load an application or a library and then uh, it compiles every single method that it, is there and stores the result in the um, system-wide cache. Next time when application launches or loads one of its libraries, uh, uh, runtime finds the pre-compiled code and loads it instead of uh, jitting it again. Uh, so let's look at, look at the results. As you can see, the startup time has changed drastically. Right, we improved it by 2.3 percent. At uh, two, we it's now a two third of what it was before. Mm -hmm. Looks impressive, right? Okay, we are done here, right? Not bad, not bad. I know that has some hackers. And to go back to history, this actually happened in what we tried to ship down at 1.0. The two months before we shipped, we found out our performance not acceptable. One developer actually got called and said he got a solar problem. That developer's name is Koshan. This is the solution provided, and we just ship in time. Right. <clears throat> One thing I want to talk about, mention about engine and its characteristic is uh, fragility. So the code it generates is really just jitted code, and it uh, contains a lot of assumptions that make it very fragile. For example, uh, type layout, right? Uh, the JIT makes assumptions about uh, at which offset is each field, or when it makes a virtual call, it needs to know the location in the table where to find the actual address of the method to invoke. All this is, makes it very fragile. And then even the data structures that, will, that live in CLR, uh, they can change from version to version, and uh, they do influence the JIT code. Uh, so what it means is, uh, well, you pre-compile your code and then you decided to copy a new version of your application or a new version of the library that the application uses, or maybe just Windows Update installs a new version of the framework. What happens then? That the cache you had is pretty much invalidated. So just to be clear, th there is not going to be any correctness issue because uh, runtime by itself uh, has knowledge about that and it has means 
built in in the cache to resolve those issues. So what will happen is uh, we will just throw away the JIT code and we will fall back to JIT again. And so yes, the code will run slower, but it will still be correct. Well, yes, this is a problem, but how often does it happen? Like how often, for example, Windows updates uh, .NET framework, right? <laughs> Anyway, uh, in this case, what happens when the cache gets invalidated, engine service, service kicks in, it will compile the apps, update the cache, and the app uh, starts running again, fast as before. So it seems like it's just an engineering detail, and everything is good. I can tell my boss. You can keep your job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> May not keep your finger. <laughs> so Sergey was happy for a while. Remember we talked about when engine got delivered was .NET 1.0? Do you remember at that time that it should come with a disk? It's not actually not Windows update. It was actually later on it became Windows update. Can you do the next slide? He was happy for a while, but his happiness did not last forever. Actually, the world is changing on him, and he just didn't know. Uh, we were asked about devices that actually is, uh, had to be is sensitive to battery life. At that time, it was Windows Phone, and then wearables, and actually even laptop. Um, let's say 15 years ago, laptop lifetime is probably what? Battery lifetime is two hours. Today, nobody's going to buy a laptop. Yes, battery life is two hours. Actually, the expectation changed. And wearables, uh, HoloLens. Think about HoloLens and spending 30 minutes jitting the code. It's actually not acceptable. And the second one is actually the workload is also changing. Think about uh, servers. When you provision a server images, you build it once, you will want to deploy it into millions of servers. And those server instances, you will expect them to be responsive immediately, rather than those servers had to spend, what, 10 minutes, 30 minutes generating engine images. It's not OK. The third one is also a killer, securities. We're generating images on device. How do we know it's not tempered? And we, our engine services actually elevated services. How do we know that we won't be hijacked? In fact, Windows actually require all the images, executable images, to be signed. Otherwise, it cannot be trusted. The last one, as we go to down the core, we go into Linux. Where are we going to do elevated services in Linux operating system? It is just not going to work. So here I am going to tell Sergey back, sorry, your solution did not last too long. Well, I guess that engineering detail was a real problem after all. So what we need, we, we need a new code generation strategy. Uh, what we need to do, we need to scale back on those optimizations that we do in JIT that make real uh, bad assumptions. Uh, the good thing that those uh, assumptions are real, just used for optimizations, like, like I said. And they are not fundamental to ahead of time uh, code generation. We can live without them. So for example, instead of uh, hard coding offsets uh, into Vtable, we can just ask a, a runtime to give us the data and then call on that. Uh, so CrossGen is a new tool that we wrote that uh, generates a code which is, which is version resilient. And it's uh, just one library. It doesn't know anything uh, outside of it. So you can replace libraries uh, as much as you want. You, the code in other places will not get invalidated. Uh, as I said, it's, it's going to generate less performing code because not all optimizations are going to be allowed in this mode. The other nice thing about this tool that it can run anywhere. It can run on the target machine at where the application will run, or it can actually run in the build lab where the library or the application in, is being produced in the first place. What it allows to do the, is that the companies now can actually sign their binaries on their production servers and deploy uh, DLLs that have been verified, can be, ver can be verified. Right. So, Let's take an example. Look at the example of uh, the code gen in both cases. Uh, as we said, uh, we, we're talking about virtual calls, and uh, a call to, to, to string is a good example. On the, my right side, you can see code produced by NGEN. 
You can see the fragility I was talking about here, the offsets into V tables. Uh, this is V table, this is a pointer to V table chunk that is used, where is V table stored. Uh, everything is hard coded in the image. What this means is uh, if you add or remove a method, virtual method from that class or one of its base classes, this code will become uh, invalid and will crash. Now, on this side on, is a code generated by CrossGen. There, is, there are no more hard-coded offsets. What we do instead, we just call into runtime to get uh, an injection cell, and then we invoke a virtual stop dispatch on it, which will run a little slower, but it will do the right thing. And it doesn't matter what happens to that object, how many methods we add to it, how much we change it, the code will, will work. Now, let's measure again. Uh, one thing I want to mention about this slide is that uh, it contains data for two different runtimes, for .NET Framework and Core CLR. The reason is that NGN by itself, it works well on .NET Framework. And uh, it's, it doesn't exist for, the, for Core. core CrossGen, on the other hand, uh, was built for Core CLR. It works for Core CLR. So, what we need to do, we need to compare highs and lows for each runtime separately. Yeah, this is the data you, you saw before for uh, um, .NET framework, and uh, this is uh, for Core CLR. What, what it means in each row, like again, first row is every single method has been jitted at runtime. This is when we pre-compiled uh, our CoreLib, system prior CoreLib. We used kind of fragile compilation for it to get better performance results. And then, this is actually our shipping configuration. Is uh, all our FX libraries, uh, framework libraries, are cross-gen today to improve the startup. And now, what I did here is I run cross-gen on every single DLL that was in the application. And this is the end result. As you can see, we got uh, two-third reductions here after using NGN. And now, with cross-gen, we have even better data. I don't know how my boss says it, what my boss says about this data, but to me it looks great. I think we are done. He is always optimistic. <laughs> so if you go back to last slide a little bit, this slide actually contains uh, many different things. When we first shipped Core CLR, the .NET Core 1.0, we are actually very unhappy because we are a performance team. .NET Core 1.0 is actually slower than desktop because there's no engine and we only pre-compile the core lab. Cross-gen for framework was actually enabled in 2.0. That is why some of the performance game that you are seeing in the previous presentation that actually was manifest some part of startup there as well. So, as I say, engineer is always optimistic. Didn't he just mention the optimization? Didn't he just go to a stop helper? And startup is not impact. Is that the only metrics that we measure? Why don't you go back to the perf lab, check out all the metrics that we measure? Yes, well, right. Startup is not the only metrics. Yes. There is another thing, it's called, it's called throughput. <laughs> so let's look at throughput net data. Here, we have data from JSON serialization benchmark. This is actually the benchmark that is used by ASP.NET team and by Tech and Power uh, suit. So what we can see here is, uh, again, request, request per second for each configuration. First line is all jitted. All jitted, all code is perfectly generated with every possible optimization that JIT supports. This is our kind of shipping configuration, and this is uh, if I cross-gen everything in the app. Well, yeah, we do have a problem here. We are about, I don't know, 7% slower than in all jitted configuration. So yeah, uh, I guess we just push the problem somewhere else from startup to throughput. So we need to think about it. You need to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna think about it. <laughs> So let, let's take a look at the uh, code generation technologies we actually have today. Uh, ahead of time, CrossGen, we talked a lot about it today. It uh, generate fast code, it generate code fast for fast startup, right? But the quality of the code is not optimal. 
Then we have JIT that actually has uh, two core generation modes. One is the minimum optimizations and full optimizations. The first mode, minimum optimizations, is actually the mode that is used uh, when you hit F5 in VS for debugging scenarios. It's for per purpose, again, fa JIT decode as, pa as fast as possible. Minimum optimizations, which makes also your code very debuggable and provides great diagnostics capabilities in VS. And full optimizations is what we have in release, right? Uh, everyone knows this. Interpreter, uh, well, we have a few prototypes of that, but none of them actually works well. And it requires uh, a lot of work on the diagnostic stack to support it. So I'm not sure. None of these technologies kind of work by itself. Mm -hmm. I guess what we can do is uh, combine some of them together. This is what we've done. Uh, we've been working in the couple, last couple of years. This is what uh, uh, Steve mentioned in his talk, Tyrogen, that was shipped in 2.1 as a preview feature. And it's supposed to be on by default in .NET Core 3.0. So before we had Tyrogen, enabled or available to us, we at JIT time uh, could compile an IL or a method only once. And only once we could decide what do we do with it. Do we optimize for fast JIT in, for startup, uh, for throughput, or maybe for portability. Uh, now, with still JIT in, we actually can do it multiple times, or at least twice. So what we can do on startup, we use min ops or we can reuse cross-gen code uh, to run the code fast. And then once we reach the steady state, we can recompile the, uh, recompile the same code and uh, enable all available optimizations. The other part about cross-gen, what we can do is, uh, here is actually um, we can embed in our images like some hints uh, for JIT or for Turing system to do better optimizations or uh, generate code more efficiently. So one thing that we kind of still experimenting with uh, is heuristic for theory jitting. Uh, as the slide says, uh, steady state versus startup is kind of a great area. Every, every single application is very different. We don't have yet an API called uh, start steady state. We don't know yet. So we kind of have to guess. And there are various ways to do that. One is a simple one, is uh, just calculate how, how, how many times the method has been called, like hit count, and then at some point start uh, uh, recompiling it. Then we can use more advanced techniques, like sample profiling or um, performance counters. For now, we decided to start with a very simple approach, and uh, what we do is uh, as soon as the method is called 30 times, we invoke uh, the Turing system, and it will replace uh, the method with uh, by the code, yes. So measure again, and what we see, yay, we are back. <laughs> so the throughput is good. The startup is good as well. We haven't regressed that because runtime actually picks cross-gen code at the first time. So all good. Back to you. So if you think about this, this is actually very similar to Java's hotspot mechanism, right? When you, uh, if you're not sure if your code is going to be executed many, many times, instead of spending time optimization all the code, we actually took the upper heuristic of like, you know, generating code as fast as possible and as method that identified to be executed more frequently, then we're trying to optimize those methods. And that actually give you a very good blend of startup and also throughput. So this is our code gen journey, uh, journey. We started with PureJet, and we never shipped in that configuration because it's just not fast enough. And we built engine for the desktop, and that did not get us across to the cloud scenario, nor go to Linux. So that's why we get a cross-gen here, right? And then further down, trying to repair the cross-gen's degradation, we built tier jetting. What tier jetting can really give you is actually give JIT the freedom. JIT never had the freedom. JIT had to do the work, but had must use the most uh, 
uh, need to use uh, as little as possible resource, but yet have to generate the best code for you. And if that, that is actually just not going to gel together. So with tier jitting, what it opens up is actually more optimization and optimize only in the code that matters. So it's just a starting of the journey, not really the end. And this is a cross-gen and tier jitting are the things that it's going to ship in down at Coast Rio. Next slide. So this go back to Sergey. All right. Uh, so we talked a lot about uh, what we've done so far. Let's spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, what we will do in the near future. Um, so everyone knows that Docker containers are super popular right now. Uh, in general, uh, .NET applications, .NET Core applications run just fine in, that, in those environments. But we did get uh, a few reports from customers, including the presentation from Steve a few hours ago, that if a container is configured in, uh, with low memory, uh, then ap applications can run into some issues. So we are working on addressing that. We're going to change some GC heuristic to consume less memory, and we're going to add uh, more configuration options to configure runtime for those environments if our automatic heuristics don't, don't, kick, in, don't kick in. Uh, the other part that is important for Docker containers is the size of the base images. When we precompile assemblies with cross-gen, we store the precompiled code in uh, assemblies themselves, which means uh, bigger size of those libraries, right? So what we're going to do for 3.0, we're looking at using partial compilation uh, to reduce the size of the uh, CoreFX frameworks that we ship, and at the same time not to regress startup times, right? Uh, then, uh, as you probably saw in uh, .NET Core 3 View blog post, uh, we're going to ship uh, a new UI stack, WinForms and WPF, right? And the uh, UI apps, what they do, what do they require? Fast startup, quick response times, right? So when you, we will spend some time actually optimizing those, those, li those libraries and precompiling them. And last but not least, we want to ship uh, or make uh, our Crossion compiler uh, publicly available so every developer can optimize the applications. Uh, I want to quickly show you, like, yeah, I know, one minute, uh, what, what is the right time to use a, a, a AUT? As you saw, there's always a trade-off, right? So how do you know whether cross-gen is right for you? In this case, uh, yes, uh, Perfview is a performance tool, is your friend. Uh, there are a lot of tutorials and uh, help on the GitHub, and this tool is super powerful. It can show you everything your application is doing. We're going to use the NuGet Patch Package Explorer. It's a, actually a real-world application that has been ported to 3.0 and uses the brand new UI stack. So what do we do? We start per few, obviously. We use collect options to start data collection. We launch our application. Once application started, we stop collection. And uh, Perfue will generate an ETL file. As you can see, Perfue can do lots of stuff. It generates lots of different data, sampling profiling and uh, memory, GC information. But what we are interested in right now are just JIT stats. If you click on that, it will open a new window. It contains lots of information about uh, every single method that has been JITed. But I just showed you the summary. So what you see is we spend two seconds, or 60% of CPU time, jitting the code. Uh, not good. So again, these numbers are point in time. When we ship the 3.0, the final release bits, these uh, numbers are going to be much lower. Next slide, I pre-compile the app, run it again. You can see the JIT time has disappeared pretty much more all of it. Like it used to be two seconds. Now it's 200, 300 milliseconds. Startup of the application is about one second, right? So that's it. I will let you show. Take away is performance is hard. And so they can keep his job. Thank you. <laughs> About the jobs, by the way. That's right. About the jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. This slides are in a talk, so guys, if you have any questions, please send emails, talk to us. Thank you very much.